Well, hello guys, welcome to an all new episode of Insights, a series where we talk to experts regarding aspects of health, science, and well-being. Today I'm very honored to present our, our guest, who is Dr. Ina Kessen. Uh, Dr. Kessen is a licensed clinical psychologist specializing in biofeedback and mindfulness. Uh, Dr. Kassen is a faculty member at the Harvard Medical School, where she teaches and supervises trainees. She has over 20 years of clinical experience in helping people overcome various personal and professional challenges. Dr. Kassen serves as president of the board of directors for the Institute for Meditation Psychotherapy, and she is a board member for the Association for Applied Psychophysiology and Biofeedback, as well as Biofeedback Certification International Alliance, where she is currently chair elect. Dr. Kassan is the author of numerous publications, including her most recent book, Biofeedback and Mindfulness in Everyday Life Practical Solutions for Improving Your Health and Performance published by W.W. Norton and the highly regarded clinical handbook of, bi of biofeedback, sorry, a step-by-step -step guide to training and practice with mindfulness, published by w Wiley Blackwell. So, Ina, thank you very much for accepting the invitation. I'm very glad to, uh, to have you here and to be able to talk a little bit about your work. How are you? I am doing well. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to speak with you, Mauricio. Great. Uh, so, you know, I think uh, a very important topic regarding health, and that is very often uh, uh, overlooked, is the importance of breathing. And I know you, you are a specialist in this area, so could you tell us a little bit about how breathing or why breathing is so important for us in all of our aspects? Uh, regarding health? Yeah, uh, well, on the one hand, it seems fairly obvious, right? We need to breathe in order to live. Uh, but it also, you know, because it's obvious, a lot of people tend to not pay a lot of attention to breathing, right? Well, you know, you can breathe, you're good. Um, and in reality, there are, you know, some subtle uh, breathing uh, dysregulations that can happen that can quite significantly impact people's health, ability to uh, just be well uh, in their everyday life, and they have no idea um, that it's even related uh, to what's going on with their breath. Um, uh, a lot of people um, consider that what's most important in breathing is just get enough oxygen. Um, and while, of course, yes, we do need enough oxygen for, for most of us, that's actually not something we need to pay all that much attention to because our, you know, our bodies, uh, you know, as long as our hearts and lungs are healthy, are getting plenty of oxygen from the air that we're taking in. You know, we're, in fact, we're only using about a quarter of the oxygen that we take in. So we have plenty of it. Um, what we do need to uh, think about sometimes, especially with certain um, health concerns, uh, is the amount of carbon dioxide uh, that we're retaining um, in the body. Uh, and you know, I'm sure we'll get into the details of that you know, as, as we talk, but without proper amounts of carbon dioxide, the oxygen that we do have doesn't get to where it needs to go. Uh, and then all sorts of things uh, can go wrong from you know, feeling as if you are um, really anxious to having panic attacks, uh, to having asthma attacks, uh, you know, having all sorts of uh, you know, muscle uh, related problems. Uh, you know, this can exacerbate uh, heart conditions. Uh, you know, this can exacerbate pain conditions. Um, it can exacerbate all sorts of mental health uh, uh, issues and create a lot of unpleasant experiences that people, you know, don't realize where, you know, where they're coming from and most definitely impacts our performance, both, you know, physical performance um, and uh, cognitive performance uh, in, uh, in challenging situations. Um, so, you know, just like, you know, breathing is, you know, vital for just, you know, day-to-day -day survival, you know, healthy breathing um, is uh, vital for us to be at our best uh, in uh, all situations. Yes. And, I think that this healthy breathing, which maybe people do not tend to think about so many aspects that are involved in healthy breathing, is what often becomes overlooked. 
right? Because exactly. as you say, I mean, uh, it's, it's kind of obvious that we need to breathe to stay alive. And I think that's where, where most people stop thinking without further uh, thinking about uh, other aspects, right? It's just about getting oxygen in and whatever or whichever way I do it, it's going to be okay because I'm taking in my oxygen. Um, it, that's exactly right. Um, you know, we tend to not think about uh, the more detailed, uh, you know, aspects of breathing, just like we often don't think about more detailed aspects of our physiology um, in general. Um, and uh, some fairly simple uh, skills can make a really big difference in improving uh, daily lives for people. Yes. So uh, what are some kind of maybe dysfunctional patterns that we that we can engage in when breeding and and why are this uh, why can this have some impact over the long term so some of the dysfunctional uh, patterns are more uh, mechanical just having to do with you know how the body uh, moves uh, when breathing you know which muscles are we engaging uh, uh, during the breath uh, you know, even things like, you know, where is the tongue positioned, you know, um, in the mouth when it comes to breathing, you know, can be important. So, um, um, and many of these mechanical uh, problems then result in a uh, internal physiological problem, um, the behavior uh, called overbreathing, meaning that, uh, you know, we are breathing out uh, too much uh, carbon dioxide. Um, so the behavior of taking in overly large breaths, which then result in breathing out too much uh, carbon dioxide, which reduces the amount of carbon dioxide in the bloodstream and leads to a condition called hypocapnia or lack of carbon dioxide. And then as a result of hypocapnia, the oxygen uh, that we do have doesn't get to where it needs to go. Um, so the brain, um, muscles, you know, various uh, organs are deprived of oxygen. Um, and you might imagine that you know this creates uh, you know all sorts of problems both uh, in the short term, right? So if uh, uh, people tend to overbreathe, uh, you know, only during challenging or stressful situations, um, then you know certainly their experience in those stressful situations is impacted. You know, they're more stressful, they feel worse, uh, they tend to not do as well uh, in meeting the challenges in front of them. But then once the stressful situation is over, uh, the overbreathing is done, and there doesn't seem to be sort of a long-term um, consequence, except that you know, of course, every time somebody encounters these stressful situations, the same thing repeats. And people often don't realize you know, why you know, those situations are uh, so challenging and just how important you know, breathing is a part of it. And for some people, overbreathing is actually chronic. They overbreathe at all times or most of the time. Uh, and in that situation, the body starts compensating for it, right? You know, our bodies don't like this, uh, um, the kind of uh, pH dysregulation that happens uh, with uh, overbreathing. Um, so, um, you know, the body is going to try to compensate for it. Your kidneys will expel, you know, bicarbonates from the body in order to compensate um, for the lack of uh, acidity uh, from CO2. Um, and then... Uh, that actually decreases the body's ability to uh, buffer uh, acid that's produced as a result of metabolism. So, you know, for example, when you're exercising, lactic acid is produced, uh, and uh, with chronic overbreathing and you know, the body's uh, uh, attempt to correct for it by uh, getting rid of those bicarbonates, bicarbonates are actually necessary uh, to uh, buffer lactic acid and take it out of the body. Um, so with chronic overbreathing, it doesn't happen. So people experience muscle pain, uh, fatigue, uh, uh, you know, even things like sodium deficiency can happen. So, and that can happen you know, over the long term uh, and impact uh, people's health and performance, even though they, they don't realize that anything is wrong uh, moment to moment. Yes. And this condition of overbreeding, which, as you were telling us, is one nasty consequence of maybe altered uh, mechanical uh, aspects of breeding, then this results in this condition of hypocapnia, which is having less carbon dioxide than you should. And I think this is another, another aspect that many people do not consider it as being important, like the function of carbon dioxide in their bodies. Because, well, uh, 
I think since we were in elementary school, they've been teaching us, right? Uh, breathing breathing uh, is all about taking in oxygen and expelling carbon dioxide because it's that, uh, it's like a waste product. That is so right, yes. Uh, there is this huge misconception uh, about uh, carbon dioxide, right? It's often painted as this, you know, evil thing that we need to get rid of, right? You know, this toxin, right? You know, there is uh, unfortunately plenty of misinformation uh, on the internet uh, calling carbon dioxide a toxin, something that needs to be gotten rid of, you know, something that we need to cleanse our bodies off, things like that. Uh, and that is simply not true. Um, we, you know, while, you know, we don't want to have too much carbon dioxide, that's, that is not so great, but we do need to retain about 85% of our carbon dioxide. So great majority of our carbon dioxide is used to maintain proper pH level in the body. And if we don't have enough carbon dioxide, pH level uh, gets disrupted. Um, and then the oxygen that we do have gets uh, trapped in the bloodstream and it, it kind of travels around in the bloodstream bound to the hemoglobin and it does not get released uh, to you know your brain your organs your muscles so it seems like you have plenty of oxygen except it's all in your bloodstream and that's not where you want you know your oxygen to remain you want the oxygen to be released from the bloodstream to the body and this yeah. is where carbon dioxide is so important without it oxygen does not get released sufficiently okay so uh Two fundamental roles that you just mentioned about uh, carbon dioxide, dioxide is one, well, it participates in the regulation of pH, which in turn has a consequence on the release of oxygen. Exactly. Okay, how can a lack of uh, carbon dioxide in, in the blood, uh, in the bloodstream, lead to disease when it is chronic. You, you mentioned us uh, that some people overbreathe chronically and that this may lead to several uh, health issues. How, how can this result uh, because of this chronic overbreathing? So um, let me review briefly, you know, some of the kind of underlying physiology here in order to, uh, yes. to, to make this point clear. So our uh, pH level is regulated uh, by, you know, two, um, you know, areas of our, our physiology. One is carbon dioxide um, and the other one is bicarbonates, which are regulated by the kidneys. So, you know, two major components of pH regulation. Um, Carbon dioxide, bicarbonates. Carbon dioxide is acidic, right? In the blood, is dissolved as carbonic acid, uh, and bicarbonates are alkaline, right? So uh, pH uh, is, of course, the balance between alkalinity and acidity uh, in the body. So you need to have the acidic uh, and the alkaline uh, products uh, in the body uh, regulated now, in order to uh, allow the human pH to be between 7.35 and 7.45. So um, so, which, which is slightly alkaline, right? Anything a pH above seven is alkaline, a pH below um, seven is acidic. So our, uh, the, the pH of our you know, bodily fluids needs to be maintained in that slightly alkaline state. Uh, going you know, too alkaline or too acidic is not, not great for, you know, uh, for various reasons. Our bodies don't like that and we don't function very well in those circumstances. So if we uh, breathe out too much carbon dioxide, right? Car carbon dioxide is acidic, right? So if you breathe out the acid, your pH becomes too alkaline, right? So that's the a consequence of hypocapnia, not having enough carbon dioxide, your pH becomes too alkaline. Um, and this is where uh, carbon, uh, oxygen it does not get released um, from the hemoglobin. Um, if that happens for short periods of time, you know, you know, 20 minutes, an hour, you know, a couple hours, even a few hours, um, the body can kind of, you know, deal with that on a temporary basis. Uh, we still have experienced symptoms and consequences, uh, but the body is not, um, you know, starting to kick in kind of those long-term fixes. But um, if, the, if the overbreathing continues, you know, say, you know, for several hours, days, you know, you know weeks, um, then the kidneys uh, come in and start expelling bicarbonates, right? So if we are lacking, if we don't have enough acid, right? If the pH is too alkaline, 
kidneys come in and expel bicarbonates, which are alkaline, right? So if you get rid of some of the alkaline products, that brings our pH close to normal. It's not entirely normal, but it's close enough to normal that our bodies can tolerate that. And that could be okay as long as our activity level doesn't change. Uh, of course, that's not terribly realistic, right? You know, we can't just stay at the same level of activity, you know, all the time. The problem comes in, you know, if, if you if the body has expelled a lot of its bicarbonates, and then you know we increase activity level. Say we go for a walk, or we go for a run, or we just engage in something that's a little bit more physically exerting, then the body starts producing more acid, right? By product of uh, metabolism is various acidic products, you know, by, uh, carbon dioxide being one of them, but there are other, other ones, for example, lactic acid. Um, and those byproducts need to be taken out. You know, the lactic acid produced by the muscles uh, typically gets uh, excreted into the blood where bicarbonates come in, you know, bind, you know, uh, bind uh, to the uh, acid and then take it out of the body. In, in a situation where the kidneys have expelled those bicarbonates, there's not enough of them around. So lactic acid is produced, gets kicked out into the bloodstream, and then not enough of it is taken out. So the lactic acid ends up you know, staying around, uh, decreasing the overall pH of the body, right? Making it more acidic. Um, and uh, that that uh, comes with you know, uh, other um, kinds of consequences, right? You know, we, we, Get it heard in the news the last few years, just you know that acidic pH in the body is not good for our health in all sorts of, in all sorts of ways. You know, starting from you know simple things like you know muscle aches and uh, um, exacerbated pain and fatigue and you know things like that, uh, and that can um, can go on forever. You know, because overbreathing can you know chronic overbreathing can continue. People can overbreathe just at all times, and the body is going to keep compensating for it, um, and then we end up in this. Uh, um, a feedback loop, right, where, um, you know, there is not enough um, uh, acid, which means that body gets rid of the bicarbonates, bicarbonates cannot take care of the acid that's being produced, the acid st stays around, um, then the body can actually make the person over breathe some more in order to get rid of the uh, extra acid, right, and it becomes a sloop uh, of um, um, unhelpful physiological uh, behaviors. Yes, and, and very often is maybe the the same compensating patterns of the body that eventually make it worse and worse, right? Like uh, at exactly. the beginning, maybe it, it's just trying to to get everything back to balance. But if this maintains chronically, then does these compensating mechanisms are gonna cause more and more harm eventually? Exactly. 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 One thing comes to mind when when thinking about overbreeding, and it's how many people there are. Some people that do appreciate the the, the power of breeding and maybe engage in in some practices uh, such as yoga and uh, well, uh, maybe even with their therapists. What is the risk of maybe overbreeding when engaging in these practices? It's a it's a good question, right? Yeah, people engage in these practices to improve their health, right, and improve their well-being, and without having some understanding of the underlying physiology, it is possible uh, to uh, overbreathe and actually have these uh, uh, skills and these breathing practices work against you rather than for you, right? You know, if uh, in our minds, you know, we're trying to uh, breathe, uh, you know, whether it be, you know, diaphragmatic breathing taught by a therapist or pranayama breathing in yoga or, you know, any, you know, any other breathing skill. Um, if we're doing that breath in an attempt to get um, more oxygen um, and in an attempt to get rid of carbon dioxide, right, if that myth um, is still what uh, underlies our breathing practice, um, it's very likely that we're going to overbreathe. Uh, and even something as simple as, oh, I got to take deep breaths, right? You know, something that we hear all the time, right? You know, oh, you know, to, in order to reduce anxiety, in order to be at your best, you know, take some, uh, take some big breaths, or some, take some deep breaths, rather. Um, and again, uh, without the understanding of some of that physiology, a deep breath can very easily become an overbreathing breath. Because, you know, what, how do people typically take a deep breath, right? They take a really big breath in. And then they blow it out real quick. 
right? Mm -hmm. so, you know, often through you know a, in a fairly large you know, opening in the mouth, um, and because you're taking you know with that deep breath, deep breath, you're taking in a large volume of air, and then you're breathing it out quickly. A lot of carbon dioxide comes out. You're you're breathing out more carbon dioxide than your body is producing, so you end up lowering the CO2 levels in the blood, you know, leading to hypercapnia and not enough oxygen getting released to where it needs to go. So in an attempt to get more oxygen by taking deep breaths, we actually end up depriving ourselves of oxygen by not breathing out slowly enough for that large volume of air. Right? Um, if you want to take a deep breath, which oftentimes, you know, it feels really nice and right, and that, you know, deep breaths can be great. Uh, it, they just have to be done uh, properly, keeping in mind uh, the need to conserve CO2, right? So if you're going to take a deep breath, uh, uh, breathing it out super, super slowly, so something like this, deep breath and out. Much longer than most people would uh, typically uh, uh, breathe out, and you know I didn't take a very deep breath, right? Just sort of medium depth breath, and it still requires a very long exhalation uh, in order to uh, uh, breathe out, you know, all that extra air um, that I took in. Uh, it, as I mentioned earlier, we don't need at rest, at rest, right? You know, if we're not running, if we're not exercising, not engaging in any uh, specific physical activity, we don't need any extra oxygen, right? You know, what I'm breathing in now, um, I have plenty. Um, this changes a little bit if you're at high altitude or if you have, you know, a heart or a lung problem. But you know, uh, generally, um, you know, if you are at rest, you don't need any extra oxygen. So a deep breath is technically not even necessary. Um, if you are going to take a deep breath, breathing it out um, for a long time is really important. And it, otherwise, you don't have to take a deep breath. You can take a normal size uh, breath in, you know, exhale slowly and comfortably, and that's really all you need to do. So when it comes to, you know, breathing practice uh, that you're taught in therapy or uh, in yoga, uh, keeping in mind um, the size of the breath. Um, and the length of the exhalation uh, and the overall volume, you know, and rate of the breath uh, is really important. You want to be, you want to be able to balance that uh, so that you don't end up breathing out too much CO2. Okay, so uh, at the end, it's, it's more, it's better to think of breathing maybe as slow rather than deep. Exactly, exactly. Uh, you know, so I uh, teach people low and slow breathing, you know, low, you know, meaning that uh, it, it, it's the breath is going all the way down uh, to the bottom of the lungs using the belly muscles. Um, and, you know, slow meaning that you are, you know, taking a, a slow breath in, but particularly breathing out um, very slowly. So rather than a deep, uh, low and slow, absolutely. Hey, uh let, suppose that a person, uh, well, uh, understands this, the importance of keeping uh, a correct or a healthy amount of CO2 in their blood and starts practicing low and slow breathing, what would be a, a good indicator? I mean, maybe if, if, if they don't have a biofeedback device or provider handy, what would be a good indicator that they are engaging in this breathing in a correct way? Um, just the way they feel will give them feedback, right? Um, you know, if uh, you know, people are taking deep, you know, big deep breaths and not breathing out slowly enough, most of the time they'll feel, you know, at least a little bit, you know, lightheaded or, you know, tingly hands uh, and toes, or, you know, they might feel a little bit short of breath, uh, a little bit dizzy, you know, their heart might uh, beat a little bit faster. They might just feel anxious, right? You know, all these uh, um, sensations of overbreathing are also sensations of anxiety. Uh, so very often people say, oh, I can't really do these, uh, you know, breathing practices because they make me feel anxious. Um, and usually what that means is that they're over breathing and the sensations of over breathing are uh, mistaken for sensations of anxiety because they're this, you know, they feel the same exact way. Um, so when you uh, breathe low and slow and you no longer over breathe, 
you'll you'll know you're going to feel differently you know the breathing is going to feel um calming as opposed to uh, agitating uh it's uh, going to feel uh, like your breathing is going to feel free right that's and you're going to feel like okay you know this this feels right this feels good um it's uh, you know hard to put a you know physiological experience into words, but uh, most people you know know it um, when they feel it. It just feels uh, it feels different. Great. I think uh, there are a lot of well misguidances or misinformation that you can find on the internet, maybe, and uh, well, especially now that we all have access to whatever information we we look for uh, it just came to my mind something that is uh that's been very uh i i actually don't know how to say in english very trendy maybe uh the alkaline diets and the the use of uh, drinking alkaline water and that maybe people think of alkalinity <laughs> is that a word <laughs> alkaline yep it is as maybe the goal uh for their bodies uh, when many of the things of or the problems that you were telling us come from actually the blood becoming uh, on the beginning too alkaline right and and at the end it's all about balance yeah what an excellent point um we don't want you know the body to be uh, in an acidic state that's true uh, but we also don't want the body to be in an overly alkaline state uh, you know that you know creates all these problems that we just uh, talked about um, so yeah it is very much uh, it is very much about balance um, and uh, um, when it comes to you know breathing practices or the diets that we engage in it's important to understand the physiological basis of it and it's important to understand what's actually you know happening uh, in the body as a result of these Actions, yeah. Yes. Uh, Ina, could you tell us uh, a little bit about your latest book, which I, and, and well, what can we find there? How can people benefit from it? And well, I, I, I read it like last year and I absolutely loved it, but what, what can people find in your book and how can they benefit? Uh, well, uh, thank you um, for having read the book. I very much appreciate that. <laughs> um, I uh, my, my hope that what people will get out of that book um, is a um, understanding of some of these physiological processes that we are talking about. Um, it may on the surface seem you know, fairly um, complicated, like, oh, we really got to understand respiratory physiology, right? Oh, you know, that sounds pretty heavy. So what I try to do um, in the book uh, is present that physiology uh, in a um, easily digestible way, um, scientifically accurate, um, and something that people can use uh, in their everyday practices. So um, I talk about uh, the underlying uh, physiology and talk about the reasons why these you know, skills and these practices you know, work the way they do. Um, and then I present you know, practical skills that people can use in their everyday lives, um, minimizing the chances of overbreathing and you know, maximizing the chances of healthy breathing that would lead to, uh, to healthier lives. Um, so in the book, you know, I have a chapter devoted uh, to to breathing where i go into you know even more detail um, about you know the uh, respiratory uh, physiology in a way that uh, is you know, easy uh, to understand and easy to follow um, and then translate into practically you know so what does that mean for what you might do on an everyday basis yes and and not only do you talk about uh breathing but also about several other physiological systems and well as well as uh, as practical maybe tips or uh, practices that people can engage uh, and include under in daily activities. Uh, you, you speak a little bit about uh, skin conductance and heart rate variability and well, several other physiological systems that I think people will find very interesting and uh, in an integrative approach and, and think about themselves as a whole working uh, system. 
Yeah, uh, it, I really appreciate that description. Yes, you know, our bodies and our minds are a whole working system that, uh, you know, interact with each other and all systems, you know, play into each other. You know, when it comes to breathing, um, you know, it affects, you know, every area of uh, functioning, every area of physiology, you know, uh, a lot of the emotional aspects uh, of our well being. Um, so in the book, I talk about uh, you know, how does breathing relate to heart rate variability, which is an indicator of our overall nervous system ability to regulate itself. And how do we activate uh, to just the right level? And then how do we recover you know, once that the need for the activation is over? And of course, the breath has you know, a lot to do with that. You know, when it comes to you know, muscle function, um, you know, breathing a lot has a lot to do with uh, the health of our muscles. Um, and, uh, you know, breathing underlies, uh, as I mentioned, a lot of other areas of physiology and, and a lot of uh, problems that can um, arise, you know, from anxiety to chronic pain, uh, you know, to, you know, sleep disturbances, um, you know, anger issues, you know, things like that. So in the book, I trace um, the relationship between in these very specific applications um, and how uh, uh, breathing applies to each one of them and you know how which breathing practices would be beneficial uh, in a situation where somebody you know is having trouble with pain or with anxiety uh, or you know when they would like to improve their performance you know whether it be you know on a um, you know uh, you know, on a, on a tennis court or, you know, on a soccer field and a football field, uh, or, you know, whether you're talking about um, being in the courtroom uh, or, you know, if they're being, you know, if they're in a surgical suite or anything like that. So whatever the, uh, the performance we're talking about, uh, breathing has a lot to do uh, with our ability to be at our best. So I, you know, I have a chapter devoted specifically to how to be our, uh, at our best and breathing is included in that. Yes, and I think that people will appreciate very much the fact that maybe uh, there are some chapters devoted to specific issues because uh, not only do people get to understand uh, because of the first part some underlying physiology, but also how this applies to, to some, at least to some of the most typical problems in health psychology or in health uh, everyday issues. Exactly. Yeah, that's uh, that's the hope that you know people will uh, find this useful, no matter you know which which area of their life they'd like to make an improvement in. Excellent. And one one last thing that I would like, uh, maybe if you could tell us a very briefly. Uh, I know we we talked about uh, devoting the the interview to to breathing, but you're also a very uh, expert person in mindfulness, could you tell us a little bit about how, what is mindfulness and how we can include it in, in, in the view or, okay, I'm just going to correct that. <laughs> and how can we include it in our physiological practices and in our, uh, with this knowledge that we've been talking about? Yeah. Um... So mindfulness uh, is uh, a way for us to be um, as we are in the present moment without uh, uh, attempting uh, to make changes, uh, particularly the kinds of changes that we have no control over. So um, the idea is, um, um, you know, uh, being in the present moment, allowing it to be um, the way it is, accepting it without judgment. Um, and what that does is it gives us an ability to differentiate what is under our control and what is not and then um, gives us a um, ability to choose how to respond to that present moment you know if we're struggling with uh, the way we feel if we're trying to feel differently in the present um, we are wasting our resources on something that is not actually under our control right you know we simply don't have the ability to stop thinking what we're thinking or change the way we feel just like that it, it just doesn't work um, but we keep trying um, and we keep you know, wasting our emotional and physical uh, resources on some on a fight we're not going to win um, and then those resources are not available for having a healthy response to whatever the present challenge is so with mindfulness uh, we're able to pause in the moment allow that moment to be as it is uh, tell the difference between what is and is not under our control, um, and then figure out, well, how do we respond in a healthy and helpful way um, that both addresses whatever is going on in the moment and allows us to move on without getting stuck. 
So when it comes to uh, breathing, right, and if we notice that there's something going on with our breath, you know, let's imagine, you know, for people who suffer from anxiety or people who have panic attacks, um, they're very aware of these uh, breathing changes that happen, right? And they start noticing, uh, you know, uh, feelings of shortness of breath and lightheadedness and uh, chest tightness, you know, all that unpleasant stuff. Um, and then they're trying to fight uh, with their breathing. They're trying to change the way they feel. They'll often try to take very big, deep breaths in order to stop um, the panic attack, in order to stop those sensations. Um, and uh, inevitably that feeds the panic attack and it makes things worse. Uh, so um, when it comes to mindfulness, you're just being able to recognize, wait a second, I know what this is. Um, what's not under my control is what's happening right this moment what is under my control is how can i respond including uh with you know what am i going to do you know with my breath uh in a way that doesn't feed uh the panic right you know so rather than trying to take bigger deeper breaths that uh actually uh, continues that over breathing and the hypocapnia, right? And it continues depriving you of oxygen and creating all those symptoms instead um just having that you know presence of mind to pause pause your breath for a little bit allow the uh, carbon dioxide levels to build up which will then um, allow the symptoms to uh, start becoming less and less intense um, and you know, with mindfully being able to attend you know to those uh, sensations that are lower uh, in intensity then allows us to continue responding in a healthy way and move on as opposed to continue you know to try to fight with something that uh, is not out of control in that in that moment and of course the same thing applies to kind of more you know um, run-of-the-mill daily um, challenges uh, you know, if we find ourselves in a difficult situation or we find ourselves you know, maybe feeling just, you know, kind of anxious or nervous, or, um, if we're trying to fight with that feeling, we get stuck. Uh, if we attend to it with mindfulness, uh, we are able to, um, you know, figure out how to respond and move on. Yes, I think in the end, it's uh, what mindfulness can do for us and maybe having or taking into consideration everything that we've talked about is uh it's all about promoting daily habits that are that uh, set our body uh progressively into a state that welcomes health as opposed to welcoming disease exactly that's a really good way of putting it yes we are um figuring out you know how to live uh, healthier and uh, kind of what to do to be healthier as opposed to what to not what to try not to do which doesn't work so well right and uh you know often ends up as i said welcoming disease you know as a result of trying uh, so hard uh to control something that's not under our control yes so Ina, if you're okay with it, I'm I'm gonna leave a a link in the description where people can find uh, your book if they are interested. Uh, I know there's not a, a Spanish translation, but uh, may, maybe some people will uh, will not have a problem reading it. And I and I think those who those who can will will find it very useful and very interesting. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yes. And I hope there will be a Spanish translation one of these days. Um, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Ina, for having taken some time to, to talk to us uh, about these issues and for having shared uh, this knowledge with us. Thanks so much, uh, Mauricio. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Well, have a great day. You too.